Good evening, Facebook family. It is nine o'clock on the dot. Listen, our guest is not here with us yet. Uh, Brother Malcolm, he's having some technical difficulties. But as always, we go live at nine o'clock on the dot and he will eventually uh, come in. We may have to do him by phone if we can't get the, the uh, video working. But listen, we are here tonight for Pajama Praise. Um, it is Monday, August the 29th. Man, this year is passing very quickly, very, very quickly. And so we are here tonight. Uh, we're waiting on our guests to, to log in. Again, he's having some technical difficulties and that's just the way technology is. And so, um, you know, we have to try to make the best of any situation. And so listen, we are here and that is what is important. Uh, I see you there, Dr. Gwen Morrison. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Gwen Morrison. <clears throat> I know this is the beginning of the school year, and you guys are, are ready um, to educate the young and the old people over at Tarrant County College. Sister Bertha Johnson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your support. Catrice Reed, loving yourself inside and out ministry thank you so much for your support your continued support this i think i just heard brother malcolm beep in brother malcolm how's it going uh a little strange right now all right well listen we are on live we are on live and so we start at nine o'clock on the dot and listen we're glad to have you here with us i'm glad so to be thank here you Man, that is a beautiful sanctuary. Wow, wow. Uh, uh, you got a pipe organ in there? There's a pipe up in the balcony, yes. Uh, I don't know if okay. I can. Is that what you play on Sundays? Oh, God, no. Okay. No, 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 no. I play right where I'm sitting at, at this grand piano. Hit, hit something right quick on the piano. Okay. Uh, let me... song in a minute conversation with brother uh, Malcolm on last night I did not have a clue that he was the writer of that song and we're going to talk about the significance of that song so listen I'm excited we got him in I'm going to give a word of prayer brother Malcolm and we're going to get into the interview is that okay thank you definitely all right father in heaven Lord we thank you for your grace and your mercy Lord we thank you for helping us with technology tonight. We know that technology could be tricky, man, but listen, you came through uh, for us as you always do, Lord, and we're grateful for your grace and your mercy and your kindness. Even Thank when you, we're not all of that, you are all of that. Yes, you are a God that sits on the throne and we love you for being our protecting God. Father, we thank you for those who have joined us tonight yes, on God. Facebook Live and YouTube Live to hear this incredible testimony of one of your servants, Brother Malcolm Speed. And Lord, we're just grateful that he's able to share with us tonight. Lord, we thank you for sending your son who died for us. Father, we thank you for raising him up. And Father, we just thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. In the name of Jesus, we amen. pray. Amen. 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 So Facebook family, we have here live all the way from St. Louis, Missouri, Brother Malcolm Speed, a native of St. Louis, 
And we've got a lot, a lot to talk about tonight. Some of you know his works, but you don't know him. And so tonight, you're going to have an opportunity to know him. And so, Brother Malcolm, um, tell us, I already said where you were born. So tell us about your life growing up in St. Louis. Well, for the most part, it was pretty normal. Um, I was about eight years old when I asked my mother if she would send me to piano lessons. Um, actually, at eight, there was a lady who taught piano right across the street, almost right across the street from where we lived in the uh, inner part of the city. Her name was Mary Stansel. And my mother had already tried to send my brother, my older brother, Reginald Cortez Speed to take lessons. And he, he did for a while, but that wasn't something he really wanted to do. So when I asked her, she pretty much remembered the fact that she had sent my brother and she said, no. Well, thank God, God always has a ram in the bush. Um, my aunt was my second mother. And when my mom said no, my aunt Lucille Boykin said, I'll send him. And she <laughs> did. Um, she stepped in and she became my, my way of um, taking piano lessons. And even sometimes when I was discouraged and I didn't feel like I was accomplishing some of the things I wanted to do musically, my aunt never gave up on me. So when I say she was my second mother, I meant that to the highest degree. Yeah. Well, well, and so you uh, started playing around eight years old. Well, I took lessons at eight. I really didn't. I mean, I had a few um, early concerts with the music school, but I didn't really start playing in church until I was 11 or 12. Uh, mm -hmm. My cousin, Vera Boykin, who was a national, well-known evangelist in the Church of God in Christ, um, mm -hmm. She presented a youth program at Bostic Temple Church of God in Christ. And my very first song that I learned that Miss Stansel taught me was mm -hmm. probably my most famous, uh, or my most favorite of all of the hymns, Oh, How I Love Jesus. All right, all right, all right. So, so let me ask you this. So are you saying that before you went to piano lessons, you weren't playing? You hadn't Oh, no, no. I was singing. Ear. Hadn't been playing by ear. I don't, I'm not even sure if I knew what playing by ear was. <laughs> but no, I was, I was singing. I, my brother was an um, early student of a well-known St. Louis music teacher. And um, um, his name was Professor P.C. Smith. Mm -hmm. And he was married to a very famous, I mean, certainly nationally known, if not worldwide known, singer. Her name was Janissa Smith. Okay. And um, so I went along, not really, he wasn't really interested in me so much as my brother, because my brother really could sing okay. uh, at an early age. But I went along for the ride and... I'm told that I used to be sometimes presented on a milk cart because okay. I was pretty sharp so they could see and hear me. But uh, singing was singing was my first love. Yeah. Well, OK. And so you went on, um, took the piano lessons and, and, and developed. So tell us about uh, your years in school, beginning at elementary school. Um, when I was first, my first elementary school was Riddick. And then my mother and my aunt, we moved to another neighborhood. Um, by the way, I grew up in a three story level um, house. Mm -hmm. My family was on the first floor, my brother, my mother, and my aunt. The second floor was where my cousin, Sister Vera Boykin lived mm -hmm. and her adopted daughter, um, her real name was Ludella, but she changed her name after she was old enough to do so, Maria Hampton Gardner. And okay. then on the third floor was another uh, uh, family of cousins. 
the house that I grew up in from birth was owned by my grandfather's sister, uh, my great aunt, Lena House. And she was from Chicago or mm -hmm. she lived in Chicago. Um, she was a, literally a real estate baroness. She had mm -hmm. a property all over. Yeah. And then we moved to the Central West End. And mm -hmm. from Riddick School, I went to Hempstead. Eventually, Hempstead started busing us to two other schools. So in the sixth grade, I'm sorry, in the fifth grade, I was bused to Wheatley, mm -hmm. fifth or sixth. Mm -hmm. And then in the seventh grade, I was bused to Vashon Elementary Center. And the building that that school was housed in is now Harris Stowe State University, where I graduated in 1979. Then in the eighth grade, I was bused to, um, oh gosh, can't even think of the name of it. But at any rate, it was in 1963 mm -hmm. when I was taking viola lessons and it was near the end of school and near the end of school, an announcement came on. Mind you, this was November, 1963. And the announcement that came over the speaker in the school was, President John F. Kennedy has just been assassinated. Oh, wow. so, so on the bus ride home, every one of us on that bus were crying a river. Yeah. Wow. Well, and and so um, in in elementary um, through high school. Um, As I got in high school, I ended up the high school that was closest to my neighborhood was Soldan, but for whatever reason, I really didn't want to go to that high school. So I caught a bus every morning going to another high school, Beaumont High School, mm -hmm. and I was at Beaumont for the first semester of my freshman year, and then. In the very beginning of January, my family moved again to a county neighborhood called Maplewood. Mm -hmm. And we lived on the Maplewood side of the street, but just across the street, north of us, was Richmond Heights. And mm -hmm. the name of the high school that I matriculated in from the rest of my freshman year and until I was a senior when I graduated in 1968 was Maplewood, Richmond Heights, senior high school the blue devils so so what other famous people uh usually people famous people that went attended high school with them or they attended the high school they attended who who else famous went to your high school well one of one of the most the most if he, he may not be the most famous but he was certainly one of them was king parsons mm -hmm. He was a worldwide wrestler okay, okay. and he grew up in richmond heights and um he i'm not sure if king is still living or not but um he 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 achieved achieved extreme stardom and success as a wrestler mm -hmm. and then one of my younger um schoolmates after um as i was growing up in richmond heights maplewood was Russell, nicknamed Rusty Watson. Mm -hmm. Rusty was given a prophecy by the late Bishop Walter Hawkins during mm -hmm. one of the seminars in, I believe, 1988 or 89. He, Bishop Hawkins, they were on the elevator going, you know, at the seminar, and Bishop Hawkins asked Rusty, as a matter of fact, Rusty and two of his friends, um, Daryl Coley mm -hmm. and James um, Moore. Yeah, James Moore. They mm -hmm. were they were colleagues, and so he asked Rusty. He said, you, "You're that singer that had, I've been hearing. Why aren't you in Oakland at Love Center?" And of course, Rusty was a teenager then and a little a little outspoken. He said, "Because I'm in Richmond Heights." <laughs> at First Baptist Church of Maplewood. And it didn't it didn't deter Bishop Hawkins. He just looked at him and smiled and he said, well, let me just let you know this. At some point in your life, you're going to be in Oakland and you're going to be at Love Center. 
Seven years later in 1995, Rusty fulfilled that promise and moved to Oakland, California, joined Love Center. From 1995 until 2005, he assisted the Minister of Music, who was Walter's baby sister, Lynette Hawkins Stevens. Uh -huh. In 2005, Lynette passed the mantle as Minister of Music to Rusty Watson. Oh, wow. Okay. One of okay. one of one of the last recordings that well not one of but the very last recording that Love Center did, I believe it was in like 1997. It was a, it was a two day recording and it was done live. One of Rusty's songs that was on the project was "He's Working It Out for My Good." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He is working it out mm -hmm. da, 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 for my good. Uh, Said he would. That's Rusty Watson. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So, so let me ask you this. Um, so, so I know you took um, piano lessons. Yes. But you know, the the gift was there. Well, I mean, God knew exactly what His plans were for my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, from from before the foundation. I mean, that's what the Bible mm -hmm. says. I was six years old at Del Mar Temple because mm -hmm. my cousin had moved her membership from Kennelly Temple. And- That's Church Del of God in Christ, right? Church of God in Christ, yes. Mm -hmm. And I was six years old, literally salivating, looking at all of the different musicians that were there. Raymond Grant, Jose Wells, Arthur Smith, and on the piano. Now, all of them played the organ. Okay. Rarely did any of them play the piano. On the piano was Sister Jacobs, and mm -hmm. she could wear a piano into low gravy. But all of them, and then because of the status of these men who played the organ, there were many local musicians who would attend many of the services that the church would have, mm -hmm. such as the likes of um, Cookie Miller, who's deceased, the O'Neill twins, who are deceased. Mm -hmm. um, Austin Lane, who fortunately is, I believe, in his mid to late 80s, and he's still around. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think. Oh, and um, Donald, oh, uh, shoot. Uh, he was, a, he's a pastor, or he was, he's a retired pastor now, um, and I can't even think of his last name as well as I know it. But at any rate, all of them were musicians, and they would attend, and I was six years old, looking at all of them and wishing and hoping that I could be something like them. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was the desire that God placed in me. Mm -hmm. I ended up starting to play. I joined my mother's church, Christ Southern Mission Baptist Church, when I was 13. And maybe about a year or two after I joined, prior to starting to play and teach music, I mean, teach, my, teach different songs, um, I was singing. Mm -hmm. I was doing James Cleveland's Peace Be Still and some of his other well-known hits and mm -hmm. probably had a high tenor, low alto voice. So I was okay. trying to sound gruffy like him. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so, so so those were some of your influences, um, you know, growing up as a musician, as, as a singer. And so when did you actually begin... Um, playing, singing, and writing? The writing, the singing and playing were much earlier than the writing. I didn't write my first song until 1974, a song called, Oh Lord, Hear My Prayer. And one of my adopted brothers, I was, his father had just died that day. And I went mm -hmm. to their house and I went up the steps to the second floor and all of them were in, in, in on the second floor weeping. And um, I knew that I couldn't hang out there because I would lose it. So I went back downstairs to the basement where there was a spinning piano. And I just sat at that piano trying to hold back tears. And while I was doing that, God literally led my fingers to begin to play, Oh Lord, hear my prayer. And my 
way of receiving new music from God is literally to either be at a piano or to be able to just listen. He sings. So, he literally so, so, sings the songs to me. So sing and play a little bit, um, oh Lord, hear, hear my prayer. Scored? I'm sorry. Do you have it scored? Um, once upon a time I had it scored, but I wouldn't even begin to know where to find it. Two years after that, because at the time when I wrote it, um, I had a community choir for 21 years, mm -hmm. the Inspirational Youth Fellowship Choir. And two years after that song was written, we did a lot of arrangements of some of the songs that we really liked. Mm -hmm. And that one was included. And we recorded a live recording mm -hmm. at Progressive Baptist Church. At the time I was playing for the youth department and the, mm -hmm. uh, the children at Progressive. Mm -hmm. uh, Delo Thetford had brought me in and the pastor of that church at that time was Reverend Joseph D. Linton. He's since been deceased some time ago. But at any rate, um, we did a live recording in the winter mm. and somehow snow fell and <laughs> fell and fell. And the choir was there and we were hoping for an audience and we had about 12 people in the audience, but we sang mm. to those 12 people mm. as though the house was filled. Uh, yep. uh, and, and the young lady- Listen, that is a beautiful song. You need to resurrect that song. That's a good uh, well, song. One of, my choir, one, of, one of the main choir directors for my choir has taken the, um, the live recording from the LP and mm -hmm. put it on um, um, CD. So mm -hmm. as soon as I possibly can, I'm going to get, a, get him to get me a CD of that. Uh, the young lady who sang it actually played the bass and she is a well-known vocalist and her father was at one point, he was the head bishop of the PAW, the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. Mm -hmm. uh, the church that he pastored in St. Louis was, um, oh gosh, I'm having some timers again. Uh, Oh God, I, I can't even think of it, but Bishop, um, oh God, this is ridiculous. I, I'll think of it after I'm off the air, of course. And I'm hopefully somebody will, will that is listening to this will be able to f tell you, but um, Sharon Johnson, Bishop James Johnson, mm -hmm. that was the name and Sharon, has become a well-known vocalist and she's now pastoring herself. Um, I believe in the PAW, if not independent, non-denominational, but she sang this song. Yeah. So let me ask you about this song. <laughs> Going to meet him 
on high. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. I've got to be ready when Jesus comes. That's my cousin Leslie leading that. Here comes my line right here. Coming like a thief and the robber by night. Have you made preparation? Are you walking in the light? Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. You better make haste, for tomorrow might be too late. All right. Tell us about that one. Tell us about that one. Well, to try to make a long story short, I wrote that maybe the beginning, if not the end of 1988, the beginning of 1989. And I wrote it with a young lady in mind who was my adopted niece. Um, and I, she was, I was going to present her in concert at one of the churches where I played. Uh, at that time, I was at Greater Faith um, Baptist Church, which eventually became Greater Faith Full Gospel Baptist Church. And uh, the pastor was Bishop Arthur um, Kelly. Uh, he and his wife has, have just died about a month away from each other, maybe about three or four years ago. But um, at any rate, I wrote this for her and she sang it and I recorded it and sent it to the mass choir. Uh, it was my first submission after being um, encouraged several times by the late Donald Vales. Mm -hmm. And my song was accepted, but I was told when it was accepted that it would be placed in the mass choir packet. I would be able to teach it, but it was not going to be one of the songs recorded. On Wednesday during mass choir rehearsal, and there were upward of 15 16, 1700 people in that ballroom in New Orleans in 1989. Mm -hmm. Three songs that were supposed to be recorded uh -huh. got canceled. Uh -huh. And so after, the rec after that rehearsal on Wednesday, Jeffrey Lavallee, mm -hmm. my friend of 52 years, mm -hmm. had all of us to come into a meeting and he looked at one of my other friends from St. Louis, Joseph Price, mm -hmm. whose song was my prayer, Lord, I thank you for these blessings. And he said, listen, Thursday at the beginning of rehearsal, you're going to be up to teach and to perfect your song. Mm -hmm. And then after he told Joseph that, he looked at me and he said, Malcolm Speed, after he's up, you're going to be up to perfect mm -hmm. and have your song recording ready for Friday. Right. Right. God did that. Right. <laughs> Well, listen, man, I'm glad that he did it because, oh, my God, I mean, those songs, I was there. I was there in New Orleans. As a matter of fact, uh, Miss Jewel Kelly had taught a song to the mass choir, and I was playing for her. Okay. And they had, uh, so I was backstage, and so uh -huh. I got to see the inner workings. And, <laughs> and as I shared with you, I was there when I heard them say that they weren't going to record one of the songs because it had been recorded already. Oh, wow. I heard uh, Miss Rodina say, "What? He can't do that song. That song's been recorded already. We can't <laughs> record that." <laughs> and so that was my first experience uh, with the inner workings of, of Mass Choir. But oh my God, man, that song—I mean, really lifted uh, the service and lifted the rehearsals. I mean, just well written. I mean, oh, thank you. Message thank you. coming like a thief and a robber by night. Have you made preparations? Are you walking in the light? Oh my God! Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you know what? I I really wish uh, uh, Jim W A would go back and get some of the songs they've already recorded and revive them because some of the songs were years before it's time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was because, you know what? So back in 
in the in the late eighties and the nineties, and, yes. and you can listen, uh, uh, kind of chime in when I say this. So music was still changing from the old oh yeah gospel yeah. into the contemporary gospel, and some of that stuff, man, y'all were doing in mass choir. We couldn't play that stuff, you know. I mean, it was. <laughs> It was too contemporary, and we went, and our churches weren't really doing that yet. You know what I'm saying? Well, let, let me share this one little nugget. Um, I was always criticized about most of the music that God birthed in me because it was always extremely syncopated. And mm -hmm. I very rarely wrote anything that was just right on beat. And I had a number of people who said, oh, Malcolm, we love your music, but why does it always have to be so <laughs> syncopated? And I really couldn't answer that. But I, sometime later, it occurred to me, God births in us based mm -hmm. on who we are. Mm -hmm. He doesn't birth music into us that is foreign to us. And I was walking one day, just... I had on some shoes that made enough sound that I heard myself walking. I walked syncopated. Okay, okay. Syncopation means offbeat. Yeah, off you know rhythm. what? You and know my what? entire Listen. life has always been offbeat and off rhythm. Yeah, you, you walk fast. You walk fast because at, at the workshop, I see you walking fast. I mean, just gone, you know? <laughs> well, so, man. I mean, it's just it's just natural for the music to flow in me in, in syncopated ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so moving along, moving along. Listen. Is that, is that? That's Glee. song back in the 80s didn't have a clue who the writer was <laughs> but I, I remember playing it several times in several programs and come to find out last night talking on the phone with you didn't have a clue that you <laughs> were the writer tell us about I'm his child well God birthed the song in me during an evening a of despair. Mm -hmm. I was in college. I was in my junior year at Harris State University. At the time, it was just Harris State. Mm -hmm. And I had taken a course of, of, of algebra. We had one teacher who taught during that first that semester for maybe three weeks. Mm -hmm. Then we got another teacher who taught for maybe another three or four weeks. And then we got another teacher who taught for maybe three weeks, 10 weeks of a, of a semester. And I got an F. <laughs> oh, wow. and, and at the time, um, when I got that F, grades were mailed home to, to um, your mailbox at home. And I was still living at home with my mother. Uh, my aunt had passed by that time. And so my mother, when she saw it was from Harris, 
teacher's college, she opened my mail. And there was that F. So when I opened the door and came in the living room, she greeted me. Ah, you got an F in algebra, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what you need to do? You need to stop playing for all those churches because they don't care. Nothing, they ain't paying you nothing no way. And mm -hmm. you need to focus and get your schoolwork together. And that that little penny ante job you, you got, you need to quit work doing that and get your schoolwork together. Well, I knew not it was a waste of time to try to tell my mother what had happened and the reason why not my, just myself, but many of the, of the others that were in the class who failed as well. So I just walked on past her, walked through the rest of the house down towards the basement where my room was. And as I was walking, I literally spoke to myself and I said, okay, I'm going to quit playing for church. I'm going to quit going to church. Oh, wow. I'm going to quit those jobs, as she's called them, penny ante jobs. And I'm going to quit school, too. I'm going to be a house bum. Tears were lapping under my chin by the time I got to my bed. And I just laid prostate face down on my bed, weeping and just, I mean, totally out of it. It wasn't long while I was crying that God once again, began to sing into my, not just my spirit, but into my heart and into my being. I may not be the best at anything, nor have the best of anything. Sometimes I feel like I'm the least of all, but I know someone who has everything and he is my everything. And I'm happy just to know that I'm his child. And the original words for the chorus, his name is Jesus, begotten son of God. Okay, okay. Lily of the valley, bright and morning star. His name is Jesus, and he's my everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy just to know that I'm his child. He sang it to me a couple of times, and each time he sang it to me, my strength was renewed enough that I sat up and slowly began to wipe the tears away. And I started singing it with him. Mm -hmm. And um, to show you how really self-absorbed I was, I only thought the song was a message for me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine that anybody could even get with the message of the song. So because it had child in it, I taught mm -hmm. it to the young people, or excuse me, the children, the preteens at Christ mm -hmm. Southern Mission. And mm -hmm. they they learned it and sang it, no harmony, just just verse and chorus. And they enjoyed mm -hmm. it. They loved that song. We happened to be out with the older choir, mm -hmm. the the intermediate choir, and we were singing in an engagement. And our supervisor, Miss Amelda Harris, before mm -hmm. we went up to sing, she said, Malcolm, you know, you got a lot of the junior choir members. Why don't you sing one of their songs too? And I said, okay. So I told them to come up and I believe we sang their song second or first, I don't remember. But I told the older members and many of them were a part of my community choir. So singing harmony was second nature for them. I said, listen, when we get to the chorus, every time we get to the chorus, add harmony to the, to the uh, melody. Mm -hmm. And so that happened. And it was both choirs singing at the same time on the chorus. And maybe on the second time around on the chorus, I heard a lot of noise behind me because the piano was facing the choir stand and the audience was, I couldn't see them behind me. So I, at one point I turned around and folk were clearing benches, shouting <laughs> and just crying out to God. And I turned back around and not too long after that, some of the little kids went in and some oh, of the wow. intermediate choir members went in. And mm -hmm. so after the service, I was walking out of the service, just bewildered, I mean, amazed that what I thought was my personal testimony only had mm -hmm. been glorified to other people as well. And God mm -hmm. spoke into my spirit and said, it's not just your testimony. Right. Right. And from that point forward, I started sharing it. And so, and so tell us how it went from your basement 
to national or international TV? Well, the first person that I shared it with was one of my main mentors. And whenever I share this, a lot of people who don't know my story often kind of turn their head sideways as if to think I'm making something up. But Dr. Matty Most Clark was one of my mentors. Mm -hmm. And in 1980, the early part of 1980, she called me. Uh, we talked often on the phone and she called me and she said, listen, I know you're writing. And Twinkie and I are getting ready to produce a national recording with Betty Ransom Nelson from Houston, mm -hmm. Texas. And mm -hmm. I want to do one of your songs. So get me one of your songs. And the song that God inspired me to get to her was I'm His Child. Mm -hmm. And I literally was in the basement at 18203 Sorrento, where mm -hmm. Maddie lived. Mm -hmm. uh, in Detroit, and I was playing my song while Twinkie was using a cassette recorder to record it on that mm -hmm. famous piano where she had written probably most, if not all, of the songs that she wrote. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we were finished, we went back upstairs to the first floor. Twinkie yelled upstairs because her mother was on the second floor and never came down. She mm -hmm. yelled upstairs and she said, Mama, we through. And Dr. Clark, called down and she said, okay, boy. She called everybody boy and girl. She said, mm -hmm. okay, boy, we're going to see what we can do when we get with Betty and we'll let you know how things work out. And mm -hmm. later that year, they recorded it live with Betty Nelson. They slowed it down. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who it was that changed that first line of the um, chorus, but they changed it to his name is Jesus, the righteous son of God. Okay. And a lot of my a lot of my friends used to kind of chide me and say, why did you let them change your words? And I told them, I said, well, number one, I didn't know they were going to change my words. Number two, it really doesn't matter. He is the righteous son of God, too. He is. He is. Right. <laughs> but after that, within a year, because it was recorded on Tomato Records, mm -hmm. within a year of it coming out, Tomato Records, less than a year, Tomato Records went out of business. Oh, I wow. never got a dime, never got a dime from it. A year later, a producer came in St. Louis who wanted to do a documentary on one of St. Louis's historic gospel singers, Mother Willa Mae Ford Smith. Uh -huh. And she was the main feature of Say Amen Somebody. Mm -hmm. And so he did a live recording of Mother Smith he did a live recording of the O'Neill Twins and the Interfaith Choir, who were also mentors of mine. Mm -hmm. And Zella Jackson Price's mother also played. Zella plays and writes. And she was one of the, if not the main musician, she was one of the musicians for Mother Willa Mae Ford Smith. Mm -hmm. So the person who set up the documentary went to Zella and he said, listen, I want to represent your mother. So I want you to sing something in representation of your mother. And she came running over to me and she said, Malcolm, they want me to sing. I want to do your song, but I want to jazz it up a little bit. Well, I don't think she knew that the song, the temple she placed it at was actually the original temple anyway, but she okay. did put a few jazz looks in it. And um, she recorded it as, you know, with herself as the vocal soloist and the Interfaith Choir were in the background singing it. And if you look at the video of Say Amen Somebody with I'm His Child, you'll see me with a big fro mm -hmm. directing the choir and directing mm -hmm. my song. And, um, and I'm going to say this publicly. I hope he's listening. But George mm -hmm. Nuremberg was a crook, too. <laughs> oh, a what? bona fide crook. He oh, had wow. all of us sign a not-for-profit waiver saying mm -hmm. that this, this documentary was not a not-for-profit venture and no money was going to really be made. And we mm -hmm. all, because of our love for Mother Smith, we all signed that waiver. Right. And um, come to find out some years later that um, the owner of the label, the record label that the soundtrack from Say Man Somebody was placed on, the mm -hmm. owner of that label got in touch with me in like early 2000 
-hmm. And the first thing he told me was, let me please apologize for you all being taken advantage of by George Nuremberg. Oh, wow. He said, but as a way of trying to rectify some of what you were you lost through that that deal, I just recently authorized HBO hmm. to use your song in a documentary that they're doing about AIDS. The documentary was called Angels in America. And in the documentary, there is a drag queen who is in a pulpit and starts singing, lip singing my mm -hmm. song to the soundtrack from Say Amen Somebody. And she mm -hmm. walks down into the audience. And the way that the film, it, that it's filmed during that take on my song is very, very similar to the mm -hmm. way they filmed the audience on, on um, Say, Say Man, Man Somebody. Mm -hmm. So George Nuremberg got paid again. He sued HBO for them using the song and for the way they filmed it. But because Did of this- Did you ever get paid? Well, because of this man who stepped out on my behalf, he called me and let me know that HBO was not answering the phone. They were not responding to him calling them to find out what had happened with the agreement because mm -hmm. they signed an agreement for ten thousand dollars to use my song mm -hmm. and he got in touch with me and he said listen i want to take them to court but i really don't have a legal leg to stand on because that's your personal intellectual property and we're not connected other than the song being on my label uh, from Say Man Somebody. And that's not a legal connection because George mm -hmm. Nuremberg did that. So he said, I'm going to fly to St. Louis. I want to sit down with you and talk with you. And so he took me to, at that time, it was one of the most well-known hotels in the city of St. Louis, the Chase Park Plaza. Mm -hmm. And he treated me to lunch in the Park Plaza um, uh, dining room. And while we were eating, he said, listen, I know what I'm getting ready to ask you is going to sound fishy. And it may even sound like I'm getting ready to take advantage of you, too. But hear me out. I need you to sign a percentage of your catalog up to I'm his child. Uh, well, I don't even think it was just up to the Armist Child. It was literally up to that particular time in my writing life. Mm -hmm. Because if it had only been up to I'm his child, they, anybody, lawyer would have been able to pull that apart and say, oh yeah, this was just a come together kind of a deal. Mm -hmm. So I stopped what I was doing and I just scooted back from the table a little bit and I closed my eyes and I just began to ask God, what would you have me to do? God answered it almost immediately and said, do it. Mm -hmm. So I scooted back up to the table and I decided what percentage I was going to um, confer upon him and his company. Mm -hmm. And he went back, he said, I, I, cause I had picked him up from the airport and I took him back to the airport and he said, listen, Malcolm, he said, I can assure you that um, when I get back, we're going to, I'm getting ready to take HBO to court. Mm -hmm. Well, about a month and a half later, I got a call from him. And he said, Malcolm, there's a check on the way into your mailbox. We settled out of court mm -hmm. and there's a check in the mail for $9,000, wow. which was, $1,000 less from the agreement that he had signed with them mm -hmm. because a percentage mm -hmm. of it went to his his company. He placed me as a covering, okay. he placed me with E1 Music out okay. of New York. Okay. And that's a highly well-known and respected music company and recording company and publishing company. So they cover 
my company, which is called Light of the World Music. And a year later, another check came for $9,200. Oh, so wow. yes, God took care of me with HBO. So, so how did it get to the show Glee? I wish I could answer that. <laughs> I have no idea, but what I do know is from reading the, um, some of the history of the producer, the producer for Glee had chosen my song as early as 2009 mm -hmm. to be sixth season, which was the final season of Glee. Mm -hmm. And my song appeared on the next to the last episode of Glee. And it was in, I think it was done in May, either April or May of 2015. And when I got in touch with E1, to tell them about what was going on, they didn't know what they were doing. They had no idea what to do on my behalf, but I was finally able to get in touch with Randy again. Mm -hmm. And Randy assured me, he said, listen, Malcolm, Glee is owned by Sony Music. Mm -hmm. And it was during the time that Pharrell and Robin Thicke had sued Marvin Gaye's family because Marvin Gaye's family said that one of the songs that Robin Thicke had done with Pharrell producing was based on Marvin Gaye's rhythms mm -hmm. and beat. And right. so he thought that Marvin Gaye's family was 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 uh, belittling him and all of that. So he took them to court and they countersued. They right. won. Marvin right. Gaye's family won seven point something million dollars <laughs> as a result of that suit. So right. he told me, don't worry about it. Sony will will know what to do. They're not they're not going to fool around with something that is that trivial. And mm -hmm. I was at the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Choruses, better known, nicknamed as the Dorsey Convention, mm -hmm. in Jacksonville, um, Florida. Mm -hmm. And he called me during the middle of that convention, and he said, "Malcolm, a check is on its way in the mail again." And I had my mail held. And when I went to the post office, when I got back home to release it, that was another $9,000 check for Glee. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, wow. And so you don't, you don't know how they, they... I have no... You know, this is one of those God mysteries. God did it. Mm -hmm. My song was never promoted to, to be a part of anything. Everything that it appeared on was... Be by the hand of God, strictly by the hand of God. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me ask you this, uh, Brother Malcolm. So you're sitting there in that beautiful sanctuary, looks yes. like a large, very large facility. This is St. Alphonsus Rock Catholic Church. Saint, let me add one more phrase in that. They don't use it often, but St. Alphonsus Rock Ligori Catholic Ligori. Church. It was yeah. Ligori. Ligori, I'm not even sure what Ligori is. I'm not Catholic, but I've been playing at this church. God placed me here, even though I told them I wasn't going to play for a Catholic church. Several mm -hmm. times I told them that, but God knew exactly where he wanted me to be. And I've been at this church now for 31 years. Oh, wow. Seven, seven different priests that were pastors I've played under. Mm -hmm. Thirty-one years, yes. So how did they? How did how did they find you, or how did you find them? I was I was the music teacher at a Catholic school, and the principal of that school, Miss Verona Bowers, was a member of Saint Alphonsus Rock, mm -hmm. and the assistant pastor had mentioned to her that they were getting ready to change the early morning mass, the 815 mass, from a guitar mass to a regular, you know, piano mass. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for someone to become that, that, that musician for that early morning service at 815. And so she called me one day, I was in the office and she said, listen, I want you to consider coming down to my church and playing for an 815 service. And when she told me what the name of her church was, I looked at her 
with a little disdain in my voice. And I said, I ain't playing for no Catholic church. And she sat back and she, she looked at me. I mean, I could tell that I had hurt her feelings. She said, oh my goodness, did you have to say it that rough? And I said, I'm sorry, Miss Bowers, but I, I'm not playing for a Catholic church. And when she asked me why, I told her that I, my experience with the Catholic church was based on the late 50s mm -hmm. when they still did mass in Latin. And mm -hmm. most of the music that they had were chants, Gregorian chants and things of that nature. And having grown up in the Church of God in Christ with gospel music that was on fire, I didn't know nothing about that. But my brother, my mother took my brother out of seventh grade because he was he was starting to just hang out and not do his work and hang out with his friends. And he was taking on bad habits and she put him in a Catholic school. And one of the requirements that he had to do every Sunday was attend mass. And because I, we would go to Bostic Temple after mass, I would go to, with him to mass. And so that was why I had this image of what Catholic Church was, was. And when I told her that, she, she said, oh my goodness, we've long since changed that. Because this was like in 1990, maybe the end of 1990 or the beginning of 1991. And so she tried two more times to ask me. And I again, I told her, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just don't see that in my future. Mm -hmm. And she finally asked me just to go down to the church and talk with the assistant pastor who had prompted her to ask me. Well, when I met the assistant pastor, I came to find out, find out that I knew his family. I didn't know him per se, but I knew his older brothers. We literally had grown up next door to one another. Mm -hmm. And both of his older brothers were younger, just slightly younger than me, but they were my playmates growing up along with some of the other neighborhood friends. Mm -hmm. And they had since moved also from where we moved to Maplewood, they moved to what's called the Blue Meyer apartment area. And it was, mm -hmm. at best it was maybe two or three blocks away from the church. And so mm -hmm. he grew up in this church. He later, as an altar boy, he later uh, uh, accepted his vows to become a priest and went to, to a Catholic high school and then to uh, a seminary um, somewhere in Wisconsin, I believe. And uh, after he graduated from there, he went to St. Louis University and got his um, PhD in mm -hmm. preaching. Hey, yeah. You know, I need to ask you something. Do you know a guy named Ralph McLeod? I know the name. I can't he picture works, a face, but I know the name, yes. He, he lives in D.C. and he works um, in the Catholic... Um, Diocesan, Auschwitz, or something yeah, of that it's, nature. Uh, a high level position there. I know but the name. Yeah, I know the name. Evidently, I saw him uh, comment uh, earlier today um, on on the post that I had with that you were going to be my guest. Uh -huh. And so I was wondering if he had visited your church. Oh, I'm sure he had. St. Alphonsus you... Rock Catholic Church is one of the uh, most well known. And I'm not going to call them a black Catholic church because we have a mixed congregation of both okay. black and white. Uh, we even have sometimes Asian and Hispanic people who come to the church. But it's the word of the fact that there's gospel music. I mean, not watered down, but real gospel music. And okay. both myself and the other minister of music, this one of the few churches I know of that has actually two legitimate ministers of music. Mm -hmm. The other minister of music, uh, Brother Danny, um, also is a songwriter and mm -hmm. musician extraordinaire. And as a matter of fact, I've been here 31 years and Danny Domain has been here 34, 35 years. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so we get a lot of high profile visitors often. So do y'all have, um, do y'all in that area, do y'all have the gospel extravaganzas or i know here in texas they have a thing where um the catholics get together they have like a workshop and they do uh, what, we, what we do that's similar to that 
um, most of the the black Catholic churches that are you know have strong black influence are in the north city area of the of the city of St. Louis, mm -hmm. and those churches and I it's been a while since they've done it, but every year during Black History Month they would always get together and do uh, what they called the North Deanery um, um, concert. And it usually was the Sunday preceding Dr. King's birthday. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, which, you know, once they made it a national holiday preceding that Monday, mm -hmm. yeah. And I've, I've, I've been director for that a number, a couple of times and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, share it, yeah. So here in, in Fort Worth, we have a church Mother of Mercy is a Catholic church. And for about 22 years, the weekend of Martin Luther King's uh, birthday, uh -huh. we would go to the um, Caucasian, Hispanic, um, and some of the other churches, and we would do a, a gospel type mass. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Where yeah. we would, they would invite a, a African American priest. Um, and we would do gospel songs. We did that for about 22 years. Wow. And wow. so one year we had uh, a priest, his name was uh, uh, John Judy. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I have but heard he, of him. But he yes. told me when he was, when he got up to speak, <laughs> he <laughs> said, I want you to play behind me. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Look, I was, I was shocked. You know, like I said, you mean like, play behind you while you're speaking? He said, yeah. And and so when he got up there, he, he tuned up. Way. Yeah, he tuned <laughs> up. And yeah, there. So check this out, Malcolm. So I didn't know Catholics had revivals. So oh, yeah. Had, one year it, it snowed and iced here really bad, and so we couldn't do mm -hmm. the Martin Luther King Mass. And so they later did a revival. At the revival, folks started shouting. Yes. I mean, yes. I was shocked. In the Catholic yes. Church, they started shouting. There are a lot of things that, you know, because of some of the traditional mores that they've viewed of the Catholic Church and the Catholic uh, denomination, they can't picture or even imagine that any of that would happen in a Catholic Church. But not only does it happen in those churches that are predominantly black, it even happens in a lot of white churches as well. Yes, where, they, where some of them have white musicians who play gospel. Yeah, yeah. Doc, Dr. Patrick Bradley says, "Shouting, yeah, shouting." Dr. Patrick Bradley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were I played. I played in the city and even traveled sometimes. Uh, the pastor who became pastor who hired me, Father Maurice Nutt. Mm -hmm. um, I played for a number of his revivals out of town okay. um, in other cities. And I've also accompanied him and other priests to uh, weeks of, of, of um, oh, shoot, shut-ins mm -hmm. where they have, they have a retreat and mm -hmm. they have services during the retreat. And I played for a number of those, those retreats, both in Chicago and in um, Arizona. And in some a few other cities as well. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, brother Malcolm, I want to do a, a little shout out. That's something I do every week uh, okay. here on Pajama Praise because people take out their time to watch. Oh yeah. And, and I think that people are important, and I want to do a shout out to some people uh, that are here with us. Uh, I see you there, uh, Dr. Patrick Bradley, Raquel Dixon. I see you there. Thank you for joining us. Yolanda Hammond Dixon, uh, Dr. Dorothea, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, <laughs> listen, my mentor is on here, Dr. Herbert Vincent Ricardo Piedro Jones. Listen. All of those are friends. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, he is uh, my mentor. He is our mentor. He helps uh, keep the academic division moving. He serves as Dean Riss executive assistant. Thank you for joining us. Pastor Craig Pullum, if you ever make it to Fort Worth, 
uh, Malcolm, you need to go over to Shiloh Baptist Church. Okay. Where uh, Pastor Craig Pullum served as the pastor, incredible teacher and preacher. Okay. Uh, Brother James Rice, I see you there. Thank you, Brother James name. Rice. Sister Claudia Williams, this is my um, public relations person. Uh, mm. So she helps get the word out, and I really appreciate that. We have one of our uh, administrators, uh, Dr. Gwen Morrison, Dr. Gwendolyn Morrison. She is one of the trustees on the board uh, at Tarrant County College, um, mm. our junior college system here in, in Tarrant County. Uh, Miss Julia Kathy Steptoe, one of the great Church of God in Christ musicians. I've heard thank that you name. For joining yeah. us, uh, Miss Annette Fields. Thank you so much. One of my former choir members. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Miss uh, Annette, for joining us, Doctor Laverne Whitehead Reed. I mean, what a God! Great preacher. She is a pastor in the city of Dallas and Warren Avenue Christian Church. Thank you for joining us. Brother Tommy Jones, one of my former choir members at Rising Star Baptist Church. Aunt Colleen, Colleen Reed, thank you. Thank you so much, Aunt Colleen, for joining us. Sister Jacqueline, Jacqueline uh, Foster Kelton, my classmate. Mm. Thank you for uh, being with us. Miss Naomi Hill, listen, Malcolm, you need a Naomi Hill at your church. Um, <laughs> Miss Naomi Hill is one of my choir members at Bethany Baptist Church, great supporter, lover of the church. Dr. Cheryl Matlock, if you ever come to town, Malcolm, okay. make sure you make your way to the Allen Chapel AME Church. Okay. Where Dr. Cheryl Matlock is the pastor, a great proclaimer of the word. And then listen, one of my friends from Colleen, Texas, Listen, a great musician, Malcolm, brother, Albert Joe Reed. Mm, okay. He was one of the founding members of the Texas Mass Choir. Ah, and okay. So we're glad to have him on. Sister Demetrius Stevenson, thank you for joining us. Sister Catrice Reed, still here with us. We love yourself inside and out. Ministry, Bertha Johnson. There are some other people on with us. I see uh, Elder Billy Wright, one of the pastors of uh, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's the pastor of the first Seventh Day Adventist Church I mm. played for down in Cleveland, Emmanuel. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Pastor Billy Wright with Emmanuel Seventh Day Adventist Church. Sister Faye Davis from Texarkana, one of the great musicians mm. and leaders mm. uh, in the uh, Seventh Day Adventist Church. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Brother Bobby Cooper said, uh, you play, he said he's played some of your music. He okay. said you are an excellent writer and composer. Thank you. First Lady Krista Daniels is here with us. Thank you, First Lady, for joining us. And listen, uh, Brother Malcolm, this lady is a wonderful lady. She was here with me uh, the first night I started Pajama Praise, March the 30th, the year 2020. Her name is Sheila Bryce. She's known as Mother from oh, Kirk wow. Franklin and the Family. Okay. okay. She's a recording artist and all of that. But I wanted to uh, just acknowledge these people for, for sharing with us tonight. So, Brother Malcolm, tell us. Can, uh, I, can I interrupt you just for a minute? Sure. He, he responded to the post that you put on Facebook, and I was hoping at some point you were gonna call his name, but I guess he something came up and he he's not watching. But my one of my best friends of 52 plus years, and I'm gonna call his name, I'm gonna call him out. Allison Jeffrey Lavalle. Yes. He's not on that, he wasn't on that call list of all the people watching. Where are you, bro? <laughs> yeah. And and you know what? Uh Elder Lavalle is usually on with us. He's a, a great supporter of Pajama Praise. We've had him on. He's promised to come back on. Listen, you know what? We've got to see if we can get you and Elder Jeffrey Lavalle on together. I mean, yeah. just to let have me, a dialogue. Let me share this with you. Mm -hmm. September 23rd, uh -huh. 24th, and 25th. 
-hmm. my brother and I, Jeff and I, are going to be doing a joint workshop in oh, Springfield, wow. Illinois. Springfield oh. is about maybe 150 mile, I mean, 100 and, uh, an hour and a half. It's about just at 100 miles from St. Louis, straight oh. up 55 North. And we're going to be together Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, in Springfield at Union Baptist Church. Uh, the minister of music is Sean Brooks. And um, so anybody in the surrounding areas, you all ought to come and check us out. Yep. Give us those dates again. September 23rd, which is a Friday. It's the start of the uh, workshop. The 24th, which is a Saturday. And then the 25th, which is a Sunday. We will be at Union Baptist Church in Springfield, Illinois. Yes. Oh, well. Yeah. And I know that is going to be an incredible workshop. Incredible. I'm looking forward. Yes. Well, and, and so and so what else are what what else are you doing? So what are you doing right now? I know you play at the uh at the Catholic Church. Are I you play still at this church? Music? Um well, before I answer that question, I'm also, I work part-time for the St. Louis Public Library. Okay. I am a public technology assistant. I work in the digital um, uh, part of the library, helping people around computers, um, helping people with printing or copying, or uh, we don't fax at St. Louis Public Library, but mm -hmm. we can scan to email. Mm -hmm. So if there's some place that requires a fax, if they will accept it as an email, then we can help the customers to do that. And I've been working in that part, the digital library section for come up January for 16 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's part time. And those are, those are my two jobs. Um, do I still write? I write every Sunday that I play. And right now we no longer have two, two masses. We only have one mass. Uh, and that's at 10 o'clock. And the other minister of music, Danny DeMaine and myself, we alternate every other Sunday. Mm -hmm. And at the Catholic Church, there's always a psalm and a psalm response. So, mm -hmm. and it had been four years probably playing here before I realized that they were supposed to be sung. And mm -hmm. once I realized that, I would started reading and Anytime I start reading the psalm, God sings a melody to me. And over the course of years that I've been writing psalms, I probably have written close to 200. Mm -hmm. Maybe not quite that many, but, you know, because they repeat often. They don't always repeat the, um, the verses, but they often repeat sometimes the response. So I write those every week. Mm -hmm. As far as gospel music, Years ago when I was writing, I had stored a bunch of music waiting on somebody to ask me for a song to record or this kind of thing. And God chastised me mm -hmm. because I asked him, I said, well, God, why am I not hearing from you? Why am I not receiving from you? And God very pointedly said, you don't have any room to put anything else. <laughs> you stored it in your storehouse waiting on somebody to record it or to do something famous with it. He said, I did not birth music into you for it to sit on a shelf. I birthed it into you for you to give glory to me at every opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, from 2004 to 2008, God literally deluged me with music. Mm -hmm. And close to 150 songs are sitting on my computer that have what? never left. And it's not because I was waiting for anybody. I just didn't have opportunity to teach them. Okay. So until I empty some of the, my storehouse, which I'm going to do in Springfield and some other okay. places as people invite me in to just come into a rehearsal, teach a couple of songs, no big fanfare, just teach a couple of songs and they take them and sing them. Mm -hmm. um, until I empty my storehouse, God reminds me there's no room to put anything. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, so also, um, now, did you tell me that you had written 
a mass or several or? I was at the Catholic school at St. Engelbert Catholic School and the children had mass twice a week, not on Sundays, like the other church where my brother was placed, but twice a week during the week of school, actually mm -hmm. during school. And I would go, when I first started playing there, I would go and they gave me music that the children, they had taught the children to sing to. And I would start playing those songs and no, you could, I mean, I could barely literally pry open their mouths to sing those songs. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned because in my class, the music that I would teach, just regular fun songs and things like that, the kids would, they would sing me out of the class. Mm -hmm. And so one morning I was driving to school and I just began to ask God, God, I need you to help me understand why my kids are not singing in mass. I mean, I know kids, the kids that I have during the week, they love to sing. So why are they not singing in mass? God very plainly said, because the music that they've been taught is not their music. Mm. It's not geared to them. And the, true that, the music that I had been given was more geared mm. to adults. And okay. for that matter, it was more geared to Catholics. Okay. And not all of the kids that I was teaching, even though it was a Catholic school, there were many, many, many people who were not Catholic, who sent their kids to this school because it had a very high reputation. Mm -hmm. So before I got to school that day, God literally had already sang into me two brand new songs. Mm -hmm. By the end of that week, he had sung almost a complete mass mm -hmm. into me. And once I started, the next week I started teaching my songs to the kids the face of mass changed drastically. The mm -hmm. kids couldn't get through singing. I mean, they couldn't get enough of singing. I sometimes would have to stop them and say, okay, that's all. <laughs> but it makes a difference mm -hmm. when kids can identify with the music that they're taught to sing. So someone from House of David Christian Church said, I'm his child is my testimony wow. as well. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you from House of David. Yeah, God had to open my eyes. <laughs> yes, yes. But I took those songs that I wrote at St. Engelbert, and when mm -hmm. I started playing here at St. Alphonsus Rock, I improvised them a little bit and I added harmony because with the kids, they were all unison. And mm -hmm. then while I was here, God inspired me to write some others. And some years back, the... Um, the powers that be in the Catholic Church over the music department changed some of the songs and their reason, I can't remember exactly what their reason was, but I think they said that they wanted them to be more biblically based and more precisely mm -hmm. biblical rather than paraphrased and things like that. So I had to write some new ones based on that, but by that time, you know, I was where God wanted me to be. <laughs> Yes. So, so do you all still use the the pink and black hymnal? We use the African American Heritage hymnal. Okay. We use the um, um, uh, I know which one you're talking about. It's not actually pink and black. It's black and black and red. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. They still use that. We have about three different hymnals that we use. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But I don't. I don't. I rarely use any of them. Okay. If I use them at all, it's just to get the lyrics to a, a song that we're doing so that, you know, if I want to sing more than one verse or something like that. Because I do, I do hymns with them. I do uh, gospel songs. I do my own uh, original music. But I also do some of their traditional um, uh, Catholic music that I can identify with and that has a, has a warm feeling to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I probably don't do it quote unquote, the traditional way that they do it, mm -hmm. but I add my own little spin to it. Um, and there are a number of gifted. And when I say gifted, I mean, gifted and anointed Catholic mm -hmm. songwriters and some of their music I love. 
So I do those kinds of things. We do spirituals mm -hmm. and I don't just wait till uh, Black History Month or mm -hmm. National Catholic History Month, uh, Black, which is in November. I do it pretty much during the entire year. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But I've been blessed with a lot of friends who have done awesome arrangements of, mm -hmm. of spirituals. So I make use of all of that. Listen, you know what? It's getting late, but I want, I want uh, uh, before we go, I want you to talk, uh, tell us about some of the people that you transcribe music for. Well, I both transcribed and typeset. Okay. Okay, transcribe means to take a song that's recorded or something that you have on a device to listen to Mm -hmm. and put down all of the vocal parts, figure right. out what the rhythms are, as well as what the main keyboard instrument is playing. That's mm -hmm. transcription. Right. I also typeset, which mm -hmm. is to take somebody's handwritten score or even somebody's um, um, transcribed score that's on a computer, mm -hmm. but needs work on it need right. some arranging uh, that kind of thing or finishing on it and that's called typesetting mm -hmm. and i've done that i've worked for well the first person who i did it for was one of the main people who started me on my career as far as my music business mm -hmm. mr robert antrim okay carl antrim's father from yeah. philadelphia he mm -hmm. came over to me during my early years of writing at the Dorsey Convention. And uh, I almost like the first year or the mm -hmm. second year that I started teaching my music in 1976 and 1977. And he said, son, do you have a publishing company yet? And I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, well, listen, as soon as you can, come up with three names that you want your publishing company to be. You have to have three. Submit them to your state um, uh, business. And um, if your first name is already used, then you have to use the second name or the third name. Mm -hmm. Well, God inspired me to come up with a name that won out. Light mm -hmm. of the World Music Company. Mm -hmm. And I'm a BMI subsidiary under BMI as uh, Broadcast Music Incorporated as a publisher and writer. Yeah, yeah. But Carol Antrim's father, some years after that, um, one of the peop one of the places, of the print shop where I used to get my music printed, mm -hmm. um, there was a Jewish fellow there and he had bought one of the early Mac computers. Okay. It was that little MacBook mm -hmm. or Mac, whatever it was called. That mm -hmm. thing cost $2,500. I know because I bought one. Mm -hmm. But he told me and he, he, he sat me down at it and he, there was a music program on it. The, probably one of the first computer programs to do it, to typeset music called Deluxe Music Construction Set. Mm -hmm. And he said, from now on, I want you to take your, your handwritten scores because I was printing my music handwritten okay. and he said put it on the computer and print it out and then you'll have a typeset score mm -hmm. well after doing that for maybe a year or two mr antrim came over to me again and he said son i've been really impressed by your scores and your typesetting them i send carol's music to new york to have it engraved he said, I want you to start typesetting Carl's music. And I did. Mm -hmm. I've typeset some of her most well-known tunes. Now, mind you, Carl sends me a handwritten score mm -hmm. and I would typeset it. He's preparing me. Mm -hmm. Sovereign. Sovereign. God's mercy. Mm -hmm. Stand still. Mm -hmm. And that's four of maybe eight or nine that I typeset for her. Um, oh. And some years later, I'm sure that she finally got her own computer set up and she started doing it herself. Yeah, yeah. But now you used to come to GMWA and... Um, yes, 
I used to actually have a class with, um, mm -hmm. and I can't remember her name, but she was out of Philadelphia. She and I both conducted a class on scoring. Dr. Herbert, do you remember who that was uh, out of Philadelphia that um, uh, taught the uh, transcription class with uh, Malcolm? He'll know. Okay, yeah, because he was academic. He's been academic for many, many years. Mm -hmm. He's another one of my mentors and supporters. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. But um, I would, I would not only do bring music and help people trying to learn how to transcribe and score their music, but there were a number of times that I got pulled into the shop, as we would call it, by Rodina and some others who would come and say, listen, I need help with getting my music finished. And I would do that. One year, we were in Indianapolis and she met me as soon as she saw me. She said, Malcolm, do you have your, your equipment with you? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I drastically need you to come in and I need you to re-transcribe Kirk Franklin's song. Whoever did it, it was, it was a waste of time because it's not done right. So I set up my computer and I set up a keyboard so that he could come in and play it in. Mm -hmm. And we spent probably an afternoon with him playing it in so that I could get it right and clean. Mm -hmm. And by Wednesday of that week, I was finished with it. And um, later, I think later that evening, she came back to me. She said, Malcolm, I know I didn't, I, I'm really pulling on your time and on your patience, but there's one other song I need you to do. Darius Brooks' song is not well done. So I need you to arrange it and, and make it nicer than what it is. And I did mm -hmm. his song as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, wow. And, and so um, now do you still do that? I haven't, I haven't scored music for anyone in a couple of years. I did two um, booklets, literally booklets upward of probably 15 to 20 songs in each booklet for my mentor uh, when I was at Harris Stowe. Um, this woman, she pulled the best out of me. As a matter of fact, we had rehearsals on Monday mornings at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm not a morning person. And oftentimes under my breath when she would ask the tenors, because at that time I was a second tenor, she would mm -hmm. ask the tenors to sing something or to do something, and I would be mumbling, but she could hear me. Mm -hmm. And one day she stopped me after everybody left the class and she said, listen, young man, why are you so pessimistic? And I stood back and I said, Dr. Wilson, I don't think of myself as pessimistic. I know I'm not an optimist, but I'm more of a realist. She said, no, 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 no. She said, every time I ask that tenor section to do something, and you think I don't hear you, but I hear you saying I can't do that. Mm -hmm. She said, from this point forward, I don't ever want to see your mouth move after I ask you all to do something. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't want to hear I can't in my classroom anymore. Well, guess what? Dr. Wilson, soon after that, started putting little things, little things that she had made up, little posters on her board that we would be facing in the choir stand. And one of those, I know that I'm responsible for helping her write, Dr. Doris Jones Wilson. It said, mm -hmm. I can't, does not exist in my classroom. Oh, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> but that lady retired. And she mm -hmm. asked me to compile and re-transcribe, as well as re-typeset, um, all of the songs that she had done. Mm -hmm. And there was a few new ones that she wanted me to do. And I put together an anniversary booklet, retirement booklet for her. Mm -hmm. And then after that, my brother, he really literally is like an adopted brother, Dello Thetford. You heard me mention his name oh, yeah. before. Oh, yeah. Dello was going to, he was, he was observing his 50th anniversary in music and he wanted to compile a booklet of, of 
not all of his songs, but a great majority of his songs. And so I put together a booklet for him as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I used to typeset as well as a, a re transcribe music for Savoy music. And mm-hmm. remember I told you one of the songs that that I had done that was by Timothy Wright and Myrna Summers? Mm-hmm. Magnify him. Magnify him. Yes. Yes. Magnify his holy name. Yeah. Uh-huh. Jesus. That was one of many songs that I did for Savoy. At the time, Milton Bingham had hired me along with Teresa Harrison from uh-huh. Atlanta, mm-hmm. who has her own thing now. But they they mm-hmm. were they worked in, in tandem at Savoy Music. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. God, I mean, God opened doors that were beyond my ability to even fathom that he would do, but he did it. Yes. But listen, man, the Lord has used you mightily. It is 1030. We gotta, <laughs> you know what? And that's okay. But, but you know what? But this is pajama praise. This is not any of the other talk shows or all of that. We can go as long as we want to go, you know, because one of the things I really want is for people to tell their story. I want them to yeah. tell their story. Yeah. You yeah. know, I don't want us doing like sound bites and all of that where you right. get peace and you know, it's not really connecting, but that's what this show is about. And you guys have incredible history that people would have never known had you not ever come on and talked about how the Lord has used you uh, over the years. And so, so listen, now you've got to promise me that you're going to come back because we didn't even scratch the surface, you know? <laughs> I, I promise I will come back. But before we leave, can I, I just hear this little simple refrain ringing in my spirit mm-hmm. and real short story. I wrote it in Tyler, Texas, where okay. my good friend and brother, Gary Blevins. Gary lives. Blevins, he's been on this show. Mm-hmm. I was, it was the weekend of my 66th birthday. Okay. And I knew when I got home, I was going to go make a straight beeline to the social security office and apply for my social security <laughs> monthly check. Okay. Well, I was driving in a rental in city, just doing my thing. And I passed this sign the day before. This time mm-hmm. when I passed this sign, God said, turn around. The mm-hmm. sign was social security office. And it had a sign pointing in the direction that it was. And before I turned around, I literally said, God, it's a Friday. Why would you have me to go to this office? It was three o'clock on a Friday. God didn't stop. He said, turn around, follow the signs. I turned around three blocks later. I got to a sign that pointed to make a right turn. I made that right turn and I got to the parking lot of that office. There was one spot available. Mm. I sat in the car for five more minutes, argue, literally arguing with the great Jehovah. Mm. And I said, God, why am I doing this? God said, get out and go in. I got out of the car. And in the offices in St. Louis, there, were, there are security guards. There's a there's a, 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 a thing that you have to go through, a um, screener that you have to go through. I got to this office. There was one young security guard sitting over, not even caring who came through the door. There was no screening of anything. And actually, this office ended up being larger than one of the offices back in St. Louis. And mind you, I'm in a small town in Texas, Tyler, Texas. So the security guard looked up and he said, sir, may I help you? And I said, I'm here to sign in, uh, sign up for my, start my social security benefits. He said, well, there's a computer, put in your information and just have a seat and they'll call you. I looked over at the office, it was filled with people. And once again, I said, God, why am I here? 15 minutes later, Malcolm Speed, would you please report to Wendell 18? Hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, 18? In St. Louis, we got 10 Wendells. So Hmm. I walked to the middle of the office and I looked, there was a long hallway and there were numbers above each window. I got to window 18 and the lady said, may I help you, sir? 
and I said, I want to start my social security benefits. I'll be 66 on Sunday. She said, no problem. She stepped me over to another window and she said, here, go ahead and put in your information on this computer. She brought up the site and she clicked on enter. It wouldn't go through. And I told her, I shared with her, I said, listen, I've actually tried to do this online before myself. She said, no problems. That sometimes hatch happens. She went back over to her own computer. She put in all of my information and she said, now that's as much as I can do. I'm going to ask you to go back up to the front and just have a seat. It won't, you won't be there for very more than 10 minutes and somebody will call you back and finish it up. She said, and I'm getting ready to go home because I actually was off at three o'clock, but I stayed over just to help some of my coworkers with the crowd that was up front. Mm -hmm. She said, and don't worry about all those people you see, she said, because they're not all here for the same thing. There's about mm -hmm. four or five things that happen in this office. So okay. I, I walked up to the front, I sat down, just like she said, less than 10 minutes later, I got a call, come back to window 20 which was across from where she was. She was gone. Mm. There was a guy there and he pulled up. He said, my coworkers already put everything in and I just need to get some more final information. And he got that information. He said, now, Mr. Speed, I need a routing number because we no longer send things through the, through, through the mail, through, through checks. Everything is direct deposited. And I said, well, I know my, my, my bank number but I don't know the writing routing number. He said, that's not a problem. I'll give you this piece of information to fill out when you get home and mail it back to me and everything will be taken care of. He said, and your check should start the, he thought it was going to be the first Wednesday of every month, but it ended up being the second Wednesday of every month. Mm -hmm. But I got up and I walked halfway back to the front and God spoke into my spirit and he said, go to the online site because I was using the app. And when I mm. logged into the online site from my bank, sure enough, there was a link to show my routing number. And mm. I pulled it up and held it and I went back to show it to him. He wasn't there. Mm. Across from him, there was someone else who saw me and she said, sir, may I help you? And I said, yes, I came back to get my routing number because I I was able to pull it up and mm -hmm. she said, well, he may be gone for the day, but if you'll write it down for me, and she gave me the information to write down and where to put it and all of that, and I will make sure that he gets it on Monday. Mm -hmm. And I got up ready to leave and lo and behold, as I turned around, he was standing there. Mm -hmm. And so I said, ma'am, there he is. I can mm -hmm. give it to him myself. And she said, all right, there you go. And I gave it to him and he said, Mr. Speed, everything is finalized now. All you have to do is go home and um, on that Wednesday, direct deposit will come into your account and you're good to go. When I got back up to the front, getting ready to walk out, the guard was mm -hmm. locking the door. Mm -hmm. It was just four o'clock. Mm -hmm. So all of that arguing that I'd done with God, God had brought it to bear and brought it to pass Right. like he only he can do like and i literally walked out of that office and sat in my car and cried mm -hmm. asking god to forgive my unbelief and as i was driving home or i'm sorry driving to where i was staying at gary's house god sang this into my spirit god does all things well well, he does all things well, so place it all in the master's hands, God does all, he does all. Oh, 
things well. God does all things well. Wow. That, if ever there's a testimony of what he's done in and through my life, that simple message speaks volumes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. man. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Malcolm Speed. You know what? You've been on my list for a long time. So I, I, so I just didn't reach out to you. You've been on my list. Wow. And, and the Lord just wow. stayed. On, on my mind to 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 contact you. Uh, I'm pointing up to him because he gets all of the glory, yeah. all of the honor, all of it. To be on anybody's list, to sure. to 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 lift him up and to share his plan for my life is is awesome to me. So thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you again, uh, Facebook family, for joining us. We've been on an hour and 41 minutes, and you know what? And that's okay because we can do that. We can do that. This is uh, this oh, isn't wow. my, my thing, this is our thing. We have people that join us weekly for this show, and they encourage and support. Appreciate it. Uh, we have incredible guests on like you to come and share your testimony and tell yeah. your powerful stories that is a beautiful song melissa harden god does all things yeah well wow. god does all things well and i'm yeah. glad you shared that with us tonight uh pastor ricky walker house of david christian church thank you uh for joining us pastor ricky listen y'all y'all be safe out there uh it is late in the evening we're gonna get brother malcolm home Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, you know what? Uh, thank God that we were able to get the technology working. Oh, yeah. Out. Yes. I was praying. I was praying. And, and God does all things well. Hallelujah. And able to get you in <laughs> right in time. And so, yes. listen, y'all be safe out there. Uh, love on one another. Um, we know that we live in a world where people will do and say anything, but listen, we are the light of this world, uh, this dark One world. last plug, one last plug. Those of you who would like some of those songs that are sitting on the shelf, mm -hmm. reach out to me. I will, I will send you an, uh, a PDF of the vocal score and I will also send you a MP3 of, of Finale or one of the other programs I use, just sounding it out. And you can go and teach it to your choir. I don't have to be in your city to teach my music. I mean, you all are well-trained musicians and well capable of taking what I would send. So just, just reach out because I need to empty my storehouse. I'm okay. waiting for God to restore that anointing. Yes. Well, I'm already making my bid for God does all things well. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> Done listen, deal. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Listen, next week we will not have pajama praise um, because uh, next week is uh, what is it? Labor Day. Labor Day weekend. Yes. yes. So we're gonna we're gonna take a break and join us week after next. Um, well, the week after next, we may not have pajama praise either because I think that's college night, oh, and okay. I have to uh, do you something have to work. with that uh, <laughs> uh, with college night at Will Rogers uh, Coliseum, and so. But I'll let you know. Thank you, uh, Leslie, uh, Leslie Rodriguez. Thank you. I see you there. Another uh, great person that works with the faculty department with the uh, gospel music workshop. Uh, of America. Uh, she says she's with the Northeast chapter of GMWA. Thank you again, Leslie, for joining us. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, for uh, Melissa, for joining us. Listen, y'all, y'all have a great night, and we're going to go you, ahead. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Glenn. All right. Thank you.